When it comes to positioning, JAMA referees are probably the easiest to describe. Stay with your JAMA. So thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the other presentations on RefEd.com. Well, yeah, it's that simple in theory, but it wouldn't be much fun if it was that simple. So this module will cover some of the tricks and skills to make you a better JAMA referee. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on RefEd.com. The date of this recording is July 13, 2014, and there have been no updates since the original presentation was released. Before we go much further, the emphasis on this module is positioning, not rules in regards to jammers. Like all the presentations here, this doesn't absolve you from learning the rules. It's just a tool that I hope will help you perform better in this role. As I mentioned earlier, staying with your jammer is the name of the game if you're a jam ref. But in order to do it better, you want to also be able to do it from the track boundary. Inside pack refs should give you adequate room to go through when your jammer hits the pack, and unless the jammer can get through the pack without being touched or challenged by an opponent, they'll usually slow down at least a little bit once they hit the pack. The reason you want the line is pretty simple. You need an unencumbered view of your jammer's hips in relation to the hips of the other skaters in order to calculate eligibility for lead jammer status or to award points. That said, if you can't keep up with the jammer any other way, take the inside. If this is going to be a regular occurrence during the game, talk to the inside pack refs and see if they can make adjustments for you. The last thing you need as a jam ref is to fall down and miss a call off. In these examples, the shaded area is showing you where the engagement zone is in relation to the rest of the pack. Lead jammer status is issued immediately as soon as the jammer earns the status, meaning she successfully passed all in-play skaters on her first pass without picking up a penalty along the way. A jammer can earn lead jammer status when starting a jam from the penalty box, but not if she went to the box during that jam. Not being lead jammer is only announced after the jammer has exited the engagement zone which is when that pass ends. A smart player may realize that if the lead jammer status was open but no lead was called, that she didn't pass someone legally and may try to repass the skater she missed to take lead. It's not our job to tell them that, of course, but since they are eligible to do that before completing their pass, we don't want to explicitly tell them that they didn't earn lead before it becomes irreversible. Likewise, we don't show points until after they exit the engagement zone and complete their scoring pass. It would be a big oops to hold up three points before the pass ended, only to have the jammer go back and try to repass the missed blocker. Also, when scoring, hold the score up from the end of the engagement zone until the jammer is entering the zone again from the back. Remember that you're communicating the score to the skaters, scorekeepers, announcers, and fans. It's also very common to add additional motions to five-point passes, such as turning your hand or touching the side of the helmet, but it's not necessary. What is necessary is that the scorekeeper sees that score, and you can see the scorekeeper confirm that score to you, followed by you giving some sort of acknowledgement, such as a small nod of the head, to let that scorekeeper know that she got the points correct. Of all the positions in roller derby, jam refereeing requires the most precise skating. Getting the correct points in a tight pack 
requires you to be exactly on your mark. A little bit too far forward or behind can cause extra points to be awarded, or too few, and you can imagine what that would mean in a close game. I frequently say that jammer referees have the right of way on the track and field. If the jammer ref needs to push another ref out of the way to get where she needs to go, then I'm all for it. Ideally, we should all be aware of each other, but sometimes stuff happens and things get crowded. And just like we should be prepared for a player to crash into us, we should be prepared to push or be pushed out of the way. The biggest mistake I see, apart from not being able to keep up with the jammer, is not being able to stop quickly enough. Refereeing is reactive, but we can anticipate certain actions, such as if a jammer normally slows down before re-entering the pack. We can anticipate this so we can stay in the correct position. You can't accurately call a back block if you're 10 to 15 feet in front of a jammer because you didn't slow down with her as she went into the pack. Also, sometimes there are things that we can't or don't anticipate, such as the jammer being tripped up and falling or being taken down by a well-masked hit. In those situations where the jammer suddenly comes to a complete halt, we need to do the same. T-stops are great for speed modulation, but not so good on getting to a stop quickly. Instead, try a small hockey stop or turnaround toe stop. Whatever works that gets you stopped in a rapid fashion and where you can reset quickly to the proper position. Remember that you're in a tight space with other referees. Plow stops may be your best stop, but you don't really want to trip up your fellow refs either. I'd like to wrap up by talking a bit about positioning yourself with regards to other jam refs. Anyone who has jam ref before knows that sometimes the infield can be a pretty crowded place. And if the jammer you're watching is very good, you may have to fly past both pack refs and the other jam ref at high speed. If the other team is missing multiple blockers to the penalty box, she may not even slow down as she enters the pack. Something I've tried to do not always successfully, but I do try, is to fade into the same lane as the pack refs when my jammer has either stopped completely or stopped her forward momentum with regards to the other pack skaters. If this helps, think of the infield of the track as having three lanes. The outermost is on the track boundary and is sort of the express lane for jammer referees. The pack refs may enter, but really need to get out of the way if a jam ref comes near. The middle lane is for all the refs, and the furthest inside is for the NSOs. So if I'm jam refing and my jammer gets bottled up, I drop back to the middle lane, as the jam ref for the yellow jammer has done here. It allows the other jam ref an unobstructed lane for her to speed through. If my jammer starts moving again, I can re-enter that outer lane as necessary. That concludes this presentation on the basics of jammer referee positioning. I hope it gives you something more to go on than just follow your jammer. There are many subtle things you can do beyond this in order to get the best angle to see points or penalties, but that's for another presentation. If you want to go further than this, please attend a WFTDA or MRDA officiating clinic or talk to an experienced jammer referee. I'd like to thank Jimmy Digital and Doff Lensgren for allowing me to use their photos for this presentation. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site. But please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.